Yeah, so probably the biggest thing that I've learned about bigger cases in private practice is a lot of people say about getting to know your patient. And I've had a few cases where uh, I've moved into, they, they didn't need much doing initially. And we've been able to move into the sort of full mouth stuff quite quickly. And I haven't got to know them at all. And it doesn't mean just, it, you don't have to sit and chat with them for ages. But now I'm much more structured in my treatment approach in that I will do a stabilization phase and then a definitive phase. Welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast, the forward-thinking podcast for dental professionals. Join us as we discuss hot topics in dentistry, clinical tips, continuing education, and adding value to your life and career. With your host, Jazz Gulati. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 36 of the Protrusive Dental Podcast. Today, we are talking about a journey and a story of a very talented young dentist. Uh, I'll tell you in a second who it is. And it's all about resonating with his story. Now, his story is very unique, and that's why I'm going to bring him on, because life doesn't always go as planned. And in dentistry, uh, as you're a young dentist, the sort of career path that you map out may not exactly go to plan. And, and there are some great lessons you can learn from stories and journeys. So the, the pathway that we're gonna to describe today is specific to one in the UK because of the, some of the, the, name of the names of the posts that we mentioned. So like, uh, max fax sho positions or dct positions or whatever so that's applicable to uk but i believe all over the world be it australia us wherever you are listening to this that uh, there are parallels that you can draw within your system if you're a young dentist who's sort of going up uh, in, in terms of training pathways so we can have like residency programs for example so that is applicable no matter where you're listening from so we're going to listen to alan's story his name is alan bergen he's also known as the cornish dentist on instagram uh, and his story involves the themes of mentorship challenges overcoming adversity gaining a work-life balance, so actually going abroad to Australia for six months. Uh, I don't want to give too much of the, the story away, but it involves so many themes, and actually it also involves a bit of luck, and something that we touched on uh, in episode 34 with Richard Porter on emotional intelligence was the element of luck in, in your career trajectory is actually very important and it shouldn't be overlooked. So before we join into the journey with Alan Bergen, the Cornish dentist, and speaking of journeys, uh, my wife and I celebrated our fifth anniversary uh, yet, well, it's actually today. Uh, she's at work now and I'm at home this morning. So I'm actually recording the intro for this episode, uh, but we celebrated our anniversary over the weekend. We went to this fantastic Turkish restaurant called Gok Yuzu. It's called Gok Yuzu. And when I, my wife first told me that we're going to this place for to celebrate, uh, I thought it was a Japanese restaurant going by the name, but actually it was a phenomenal Turkish restaurant. Some of the best Turkish food I've ever had, even better, dare I say, than when I went to Turkey a few times. Uh, it's, it was in Finchley where we went in, in, in London, but I believe there are a few branches around. So if you're ever in that part of the world, definitely check out Gok Yuzu. It's amazing. And don't worry, this is not the Petrusa Dental Pearl I was just sharing. Uh, you know, I know some of you are foodies, so I thought I'd share that little nugget with you. Uh, but the Petrusa Dental Pearl is coming in a second. I just want to share some very exciting news with you that September is no longer going to be named September. It will be Splintember. Thank you, Ricky Bopal, for giving me that suggestion of a name. But basically, September, all the episodes that I'm going to release are going to be to do with splints. They're different types of splints. I want to talk about Michigan, Soft, Tanner, anterior deprogrammers, anterior midpoint stop appliances, uh, anterior repositioning splints. I want to talk about all of them and I want to really break it down, simplify it. Uh, I, I posted on the Protrusive Dental community recently, like, what do you guys want to know? Like, how can I help you in your journey with splints? Uh, and some of you had some great suggestions points. So, so some of them were like, uh, can you please produce a flow chart? Can you show some like A to Z videos? So I'll try and do that as much as possible for Splint Timber. So join me uh, in September, Splint Timber, for loads of uh, Splint content I want to share with you all. Uh, and if there's any specific, anything specific you want to know, please reach out to me, message me, email me, and let me know. And so the protrusive dental pearl I have for you before we uh, dive into the episode is when you are cementing crowns, so this could be temporary crowns or definitive crowns, when you're cementing them in, uh, quite often after you cement it in, you get loads of mess everywhere and you have to spend some time actually, you know, getting a scaler or something and scaling the, the facial surface of the crown so the patient doesn't walk out with this horrible white cement or definitive cement. Uh, and, and also uh, the gingiva, you have to like clean up the gingiva as well to, to, to remove the excess cement, which is very time consuming and annoying. So uh, a tip I've absorbed over the years is you get a, a micro brush 
and you dip it in Vaseline. So, so once you've tried your temporary or definitive crown inside and you checked everything and you're ready to cement and everything's dry and ready, you'll get some Vaseline and you'll paint this Vaseline a little bit on the gingiva, a little bit around the, the crown on the outside surface. Obviously, you don't want to put it on the intaglio surface, so on the facial surface, for example, of the crown. Uh, and you have to be very careful with this. You want to put a very thin amount on the adjacent teeth, proximal surfaces. Uh, you don't put too much because as you seat the crown, the Vaseline can creep inside the crown. So it has to be like a very thin film. So now when you load up the cement and put it in, it's going to be the easiest cleanup ever. So that's the, the Pearl I have for you. And also an additional Pearl I have for you is I'm very uh, much a fan of using long handled pink TP brushes when I'm cementing posterior crowns to just clean out the uh, embrasure space and, 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 and clean out any excess cement uh, as well as flossing. So floss is great at clearing the contact, but sometimes to get the bulk of the uh, sort of cement out, I use a TP brush, an incidental brush, long handle. And I think for the sake of you know, a couple of pennies, it makes my appointment go quicker, smoother, and I've never had any cement stuck between, even I can verify that radiographically since I've been doing this. So it's a great thing to do. And even if you have a really bad day, uh, and it can happen sometimes in tricky situations, and you actually leave some cement uh, and you can't floss, you know that the patient can TP. And as we, can, we can talk about another time, you know, the, the chewing action will actually break down the, the cement in between the, the teeth, and eventually you can sort of uh, work at it or use those little serrated saws and stuff. But ideally, you want to prevent all that. So the Vaseline can really help you to prevent that and also a much easier cleanup. So I hope that was useful. And let's join in and, and listen to the stories uh, and, and, the, and the lessons and the themes with Alan Bergen, the Cornish dentist. Alan Bergen, welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast, my friend. Hi, how's it? I'm, I'm doing great, man. I was going. I'm just want to tell everyone about how I uh, found out about you. Uh, I connected with you. I think earlier on in in the sort of podcast, we I think it was uh, an episode about splints or something, and we sort of like you know Instagram messaging each other about splints. Yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Struck a few chords with, uh, with you know, looking at we're doing the same sort of thing and uh, Dawson style. So yeah, just yeah, a lot of uh, similarities. That's right. And then later on, you know, I put a, a reading list out recently and then you sort of uh, bounce back. And so I think we've got quite a few similarities. And uh, <laughs> what I noticed about you was you when, when, I, when I sort of um, uh, connected on Instagram with you, uh, your um, dentist Instagram profile, the, the Cornish dentist, is literally like a dental pornography and nothing short of it. <laughs> Thank you. Honestly, it's a, yeah. it's a great profile. And uh, I mean, one of the things that we can talk about is, is, is that but amongst uh, other things that I want you to bring you on for. But just for, for those listening right now, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you qualified and your career journey? Because a, we, we be, a lot of what we will be discussing today will be career focused about what decisions me and you have made in our career so far and <clears> how we can get into full mouth dentistry, comprehensive dentistry without necessarily specializing. Yeah, sure, sure. So um, I trained in Cardiff at uh, Cardiff Uni, graduating in 2012, and uh, I loved Cardiff, and then decided that uh, we're going to stick around in that area. And my year was actually the first year that uh, had to apply for DF1 online. So they went, they changed from the uh, central change to the central recruitment scheme rather than just you know having a room full of people and uh mixing in that way so uh, everybody applied online and my application actually didn't go through properly oh God. and so when i phoned them up i said you know what what's the situation and they said yeah yeah i can see uh, all your information all the details and everything um, but the form hasn't come through as submitted so we take late submissions very seriously you have to apply again next year and uh, so I was no a bit no way. Yeah, I mean, that was it. Literally, um, that was the end of my DF1 before it even started. So wow. I basically had, I pretty much had one job that I could apply for, which was a DF2 12 months max fax post. And the reason all the other ones were off the cards were because they had a six month community post, post attached which you had to have a performer number for. Mm -hmm. So by complete fluke and coincidence, uh, I was due to do a two-week post at that MaxFax unit the next month. And so I pretty much just turned up and said to the consultant, you know, on the first day, look, just so you know, I'm going to be putting my name in the hat for this job. And he sort of said, 
you do realize that everyone else applying for this is going to be one, two, maybe three years qualified. And uh, he said, what, well, you know, you haven't even got a degree yet. <laughs> so <laughs> I sort of said, yep, that's, that's the situation. And uh, he's like, okay, let's see how your placement goes. And so I was just like threw myself into that placement, just doing everything I could, <clears throat> put my hand up. I mean, for that placement, people. Alan, was pretty much like a, a two week job interview, right? Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. And um, yeah, I, I loved it. I actually really enjoyed the post, the, the, the placement. That was the main thing as well. And then right at the end, I, I went into the consultant and sort of said, you know, I'll <laughs> hopefully see you again. And he, he, he pretty much said to me, you know, don't think I'm going to give you any favors. Um, we've got, this is one of, this is one of the most popular posts in the area. So um, mm -hmm. see how it goes. And, and, and I got, I got the position. I got the DF2 Amazing. post. And that was and, just the one post? Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well done. So I did that first of all. <clears throat> And then went on to do DF1. And um, when, I, when I went to the meet the trainer thing, I kind of found out that all of the trainers had sort of gone around rumor mill that, that I hadn't actually filled the forms in. And that's sort of what they'd, they'd told everybody. And oh. so uh, I, was, I was a bit like, okay, that's fine. I just got to prove myself. And, but then the Max Facts background went down pretty well. And so I worked again then in the Ronda Valley. She's a pretty high needs area. Uh, some awesome patients, lovely people that I worked with. But you, you know, again, you just get stuck in and, and saw a lot of a lot of high needs there. What was that um, like, uh, Alan, going from uh, MaxFax and then into practice? Because um, a lot of people sort of worry about going into MaxFax and then going back into to practice. How did you? I mean, your your story is very unique in that you almost did it the other way around. But how <laughs> yeah. did you? It's amazing, actually. So you, at one point, you you know maybe in the middle of fifth year before you went off a study leave or whatever was the last restoration you did maybe, and suddenly yeah. you go through all this MaxFax and then you're now doing your DF one. How did you find that transition? Um, not too difficult, actually, <clears throat> because the one thing I think Max Fax does for you is it pushes you to your limits and also gives you a bit of real world realization. And you, whilst you can still then reflect and be, you know, think about all the procedures you haven't done at the end of the day, you've, you've seen some pretty intense situations in the hospital and you can kind of think, actually it is just a tooth. Like, let's not mm -hmm. get too over the top about it. Um, and, and some of the scenarios you, you, you treat in, in Max Fax, you end up being quite glad just to take a tooth out or, or do a filling. And um, mm. yeah, I didn't find it too difficult. And, and it was still DF1, you know, so there was as much hand holding as you needed. But I did find I was getting a lot of extractions ending up on my list and my boss did not like take te taking teeth out. So okay. he was just sending all this stuff my way. And, um, and I think, yeah, I think it worked out well for both of us. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it was a great, great year actually. And um, then after that, my wife, we were, she was working in Cardiff as well. And she's also a dentist. Me, uh, she's a therapist. Okay, yeah, cool. So hygiene and therapy. And she said, uh, I've always wanted to go traveling. We, we never went traveling. And I was a bit like, oh, okay, you know, um, I've been offered another position uh, straight after, after the DF1. And we kind of looked at it and said, you know, there's no other time that you're going to have a definite break that, you know, you get a one year contract in DF1. So I said, yeah, sure, let's do it. So we went traveling for six months. And um, we just went all around Asia, uh, Australia, New Zealand. And my worry was the same as after MaxFax, you know, I'm going to come back and everyone else is going to have got ahead. I'm going to be mm. left behind. How, how am I going to catch up again? Mm. And um, actually, it wasn't a problem. Kind of got back and found that, um, you know, things hadn't moved on all that much and, and we had a great experience. 
You don't play by the rules, do you, Alan? You always do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> you just like doing something different. I like it. I, I like where it's going. It's very good, actually. And I think it's going to help a lot of people who are in, in I mean, you'll hear about people in very unique situations. I like your story. Uh, it's very different. And you also touched on the, having that break and almost you get, you get, you get FOMO, you get the fear of missing out. And they're like, oh, you oh know, yeah. everyone's uh, going to be going ahead. What if I get left behind? But, you know, you, I can tell from the, the type of dentistry you're doing that you certainly have not been left behind. So how did you, how, how do you fast forward to the, the, the Cornish dentist that you are now? How, how do you get to, to, to the type of dentistry that you're doing now? So um, we moved to Bath after we went traveling. And uh, the, I, I was in a mixed practice there. And my thought process was, you know, I really enjoyed Max Fax implants is going to be my thing. And so I did the um, implant master's degree through Bristol. And I was in quite a fortunate position there where my practice was placing quite a lot of implants. So my boss was willing to somewhat mentor me, hold my hand a bit. Because one thing you find on the MSC is it's an incredible course and I really, really enjoyed it, but you don't have a huge amount of hands-on. So, or, or that's not quite fair, actually, I suppose. It's, you don't do a lot of cases. So you have quite a lot of hands-on, but it's just one or two cases each year. And, but those cases are done to the textbook gold standard. So you learn a lot. You just haven't repeated your, your skill set that much. So that meant that in practice, once I was into the second year, my boss said, great, uh, you know, you can start placing simple implants with me. I'll be there if you need any help. And, and um, that was a really good way to be able to do that postgraduate because it meant that y you could still practice. And mm -hmm. I know some friends of mine who were on the course had to pay quite a lot to get mentors in to observe them. And uh, it just makes it more difficult to, mm, to get the big practice. Time. Um, and it was in that position that I sort of decided, you know, I saw these posts on Facebook, these amazing cases, and I thought, that's what I want to be doing. I want to, I, I want to do that sort of dentistry. And the one thing everyone was advocating was photography and mm -hmm. taking decent photos of your work, and that's how you can reflect and, and improve. And so I'd already been taking photos quite a bit, but I just sort of trying to, trying to up that and at least trying to get a before and after or, or during procedure photos, maybe not the full protocol, but that's why I started to be able to just self critique my own work and, uh, and not just the work critique, your photographs, your, your ability to, to take a decent photo. And the reason then I wanted to do that was to build a portfolio and move into private practice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, then about two years ago, the, an opportunity came well, but actually it was longer than that because this opportunity came up for a private practice job that just came through one of the guys on the implant course he said, Oh, mm -hmm. there's an implant position in Cornwall. Would anyone be interested? And it was just as vague as that. And I was on holiday with my wife and her family. And I didn't tell her cause she'd mentioned she, I knew she would want to go back to Cornwall one day. That's where her family's from. Ah. But I was sort of dragging my heels cause uh, things were going well in bar. And so, I applied for this job and I didn't tell her. And, uh, and the guy messaged me back saying, uh, yeah, sure. Have you got any photos of your work and some x-rays or whatever? I mean, I'm by a pool in Portugal. I was like, yeah, I've got loads of pictures. And so I just <laughs> picked out my favorites and sent them off. And that was my first sort of realization of, you know, actually the, the power of a, a portfolio. Mm, brilliant. And, uh, just kind of built from there. And then the only problem with that was that when I got down to Cornwall, um, I didn't have that impetus and that drive to actually take photos anymore quite as much because I, I wasn't going to necessarily be building a portfolio because this practice I was in, you know, the stand, I, I didn't ever dream of being in the practice that, that, I, that I was in. I actually wasn't even going to apply for the post when I found out which practice it was because I, they do a lot of, work that I, you know, almost didn't feel worthy of. Did, did of you feel as though you had a, a term called, I don't know if you come across it, imposter syndrome? 
Do you know what? I don't, I don't know if it was even imposter syndrome because I think imposter syndrome is where you um, you don't believe you're kind of as good as you are. And uh, I think I was, you know, I actually wasn't the, wasn't good enough at that point. <laughs> but I actually had the job offer 12 months before the job became available, which is see. a bit odd. And so I just decided in that 12 months that I, if I don't improve and get as good as I possibly can in my basic dentistry, I'm going to sink when I get into this new job. So I took that 12 months and just nailed the basics, nailed a rubber dam, nailed my photography. And, and I just took it from there, really. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yeah, the Instagram page, that was purely, I just started it because it was my new impetus to take photos, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I said on my webinar the other night, I said, you know, there's nothing like having a few thousand dentists seeing your cases and, and your photos and, you, you know, it makes you just just try that a little bit harder, get do those extra little bits that you think no one would see and, and it, everybody benefits really. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think a lot of people say this and I, and I wholly agree that the quickest way to improve your dentistry is by taking photos and blowing it up and zooming into the single teeth, putting it on social media because you sort of have to get really got your comfort zone the first time you do it. I remember, you know, I remember the first time I posted online, I was crapping myself. So what, is, what are people Their face out the way? <laughs> Absolutely. So then the next question I've got for you now leading up to the, the saucy stuff of this uh, episode is... One thing I, I look at your case. Sorry about the money on it. Just, just have a good time, learn something from it, and then it might not go to plan, but something will, and then you can. This um, about getting started. Uh, just put something on. Put something on social media, not because everyone else is doing it, but because it will actually make you a better dentist. So thank you so much, as always, for listening all the way to the end. Uh, join me for Splint Timber. I think I've got, got a couple more episodes for August coming out, some good ones. Next one being on personal branding. So we've got Shaz Memon from Digimax talking about personal branding. Should you have a website as an associate? Should you have a logo? Do you have the audacity to have a logo and you're only one year qualified? We're going to be talking about this sort of stuff. And don't worry, the answer is not very harsh at all. So uh, we're going to be going into deep into websites and that sort of stuff. So join us for the next episode. And of course, Splintember in September, which I'm really looking forward to. Thanks for those of you who signed up uh, for the waiting list on occlusion2020.com. We've got a few number of people there who I'll be contacting closer to time. Uh, and have an awesome week, guys. Thanks for joining me.